Thank you. I think it's still good morning and maybe good afternoon, I'm not sure. Uh, good morning to all of you. Um, that's the title, that's the new title. Um, but the, the inspiration for this paper is not a part of the title. The inspiration was the Great Recession of 2007, 2009. And it may surprise you to learn, most of you are non-economists, but we economists have basically decided to disagree still on the fundamental causes of that event. Now that's less surprising given the fact that economic historians are still debating the origins of the Great Depression of the 1930s. And there was a famous event about in 2002 where uh, there was a celebration in honor of one of the great scholars on the Great Depression, namely Milton Friedman. Milton Friedman is a Nobel laureate. He is a great scholar on monetary economics. Of course, he's, he's gone now. But in 2002, there was an, a celebration in honor of his 90th birthday. And someone by the name of Ben Bernanke, who was a scholar from Princeton University at the time, gave a very, very sophisticated talk. And at the end of the talk, he said, essentially, I'm paraphrasing. He said, Dr. Friedman, we are sorry, you were right. Uh, we were wrong. Uh, we're very sorry about that, and we will not let it happen again. And as a matter of fact, five years later, in 2007, Ben Bernanke appears as the head of the Federal Reserve, and we got a major crisis. So, I said economists don't agree on the fundamental causes, but this is what they do agree on in terms of the crisis. It was a housing crisis. It was a crisis of the financial system. A lot of debt built up in the system. There was regulatory failure. The, regula the regulatory agencies failed to regulate. The credit agencies failed to detect that there was a problem. These, all these factors are things we agree on. But the fundamental factors, what you might call the real underlying drivers of this recession, some of which I mentioned, are the sources of disagreement. And my paper deals with two and three. What's one doing there? One is kind of a placeholder for everything else that I'm not going to talk about. But that particular hypothesis says a, we know that excessive credit creation leads to a banking crisis, but these guys are saying that inequality is the reason for the credit creation. So they were basically arguing that the US political system was very concerned about growing in inequality. They couldn't handle it directly. They couldn't deal with it or solve it directly. They chose to solve it by providing a lot of credit to, to basically uh, allow what it was called the subprime sector of households to, to, to finance their mortgages. I'm not convinced by that, but that's not a part of this talk. I'm going to focus on the second and third. And the reason I'm going to talk about the second and the third is that both involve something that is quite interesting to me, namely flows of capital from one country to another. So I'm basically going to say that there's something to the hypothesis that global flows of capital or finance have something to do with this crisis. And more importantly, we should worry about a future crisis that might evolve on the back of this situation. And in particular, number three, which says that the international monetary system is flawed. The structure is flawed. There are problems with it that could produce another crisis. What's wrong with it? A lot of people in the world would agree that what's wrong, in it, what's wrong with that system, with the international monetary and financial system, is that the US is too important to it. It's too central. The United States is too central to the international monetary system. It plays too great of a role. And the US dollar, in particular, plays too prominent a role. And there's a list of factors which basically describe the role of the United States in the international monetary system. And the first few sound like the US is providing a global public good. Sound pretty good that they're doing some things that nobody else is doing. 
whether their veto power in the IMF is problematic or not is, is another question. But number five is the most problematic because, that's, because what number five says is that the U.S., as a result of its role, is the largest debtor in the entire world economy. In fact, larger than any other country in the history of the world. And that's why Larry Summers said about 10 years ago that it, mu it, is, it is sort of strange that the most powerful country in the world is the biggest net debtor in the world. Well, people who make some of this argument look at pictures like this. And I don't know whether you can see the entire code, but this is something called global imbalances, current account imbalances. We're going to be less technical here and call these, instead of the fancy term current account balances, trade deficits and trade surpluses. If you're above the line here, you're a trade surplus country. You export more than you import. And if you're below the line, you are a trade deficit country. You import more than you export. And the fact of the matter is, is that the United States has been a trade deficit country since 1982, every single year, except for one when it ran a slight surplus. How do you accomplish this great act of importing more than you export, which means you are consuming more than you're producing every single year? You have to finance it by attracting capital from the rest of the world. So all those countries that are above the line, zero, are basically net lenders of capital to countries like the United States to allow the U.S. to consume more than it produces every year. And there's a lot going on here, but what I want you to focus on are that part of the, the above the line countries that are, include China and the emerging Asian countries excluding China, that combination. They are accused of causing this crisis by generating a savings glut, by saving more than they could use at home. And basically, since the Asian financial crisis, they've been doing that. And they, therefore, have been having an extra savings, and they have been sending that savings to the United States, buying assets in the US, and fueling credit. And that is basically the argument that, A, the US is contributing to the problem because they are profligate. We are spending more than we are producing. But helping us do that are these Asian emerging countries who are sending us their excess capital. This is very strange. This breaks all the notions that international economists had because capital is, a flow, is supposed to flow downhill, not uphill. Meaning, capital is supposed to flow from richer countries, which have a lot of it, to poorer countries, which have a lot less of it. And this flow of capital is the opposite. Well, there were a lot of international economists who looked at these, these bigger and bigger bars and said there's going to be a crisis. A crisis is coming. So you could see 2006, the crisis is looming. And they said, there's going to be a massive global crisis as a result of that. And they were right. There was a crisis. But it was not the crisis they predicted. The crisis they predicted was that people would massively sell US dollar assets. They would just say, the US has been doing this for so long. They're vulnerable to a crisis. We're going to sell everything that we own in the United States. And the dollar is going to collapse and interest rates in the United States are going to go sky high. That was the prediction. The crisis they got was the opposite. Everybody sent more capital to the United States. They bought everything they possibly could in the US. The dollar got stronger. Interest rates went down. You can see that after the crisis, those imbalances are still there. And the prediction is that those imbalances will remain. Now, here's another imbalance. As long as the United States runs a trade deficit, and as long as they borrow to finance that trade deficit, what happens? The stock of liabilities that the United States has to the rest of the world keep going up, and the stock of claims on the United States of the rest of the world keep going up. So you get what is called a very large increase in net external assets in China, emerging Asia, and other countries and huge net debts 
in the United States. That is supposed to create the crisis that we're still waiting for. But here's the problem. Those bars below the line, that's the net liabilities of the United States. They're getting bigger and bigger and bigger in the negative direction, those blue bars. The U.S. owes more and more and more to the rest of the world. Is this a problem for the United States? You'd think it is. But look at the line above, look at the red line. The United States makes more money as a result from the rest of the world, despite these huge liabilities that it has as a result of borrowing and borrowing and borrowing over years. And meanwhile, a country like China, look at those bars. They have much more assets than they have liabilities. They're a net creditor country. Look at the red line. They're losing. They get less money from their assets than they pay out on their liabilities. But this, this doesn't tell the full story, because you know what happened? The Asian central banks that are a part of this, thanks, the Asian central banks did not buy the worst assets that we know as the toxic assets, the really horrible stuff that the financial industry produced. They bought plain old vanilla US Treasury bonds. So who bought the worst stuff? Not the trade surplus countries, but West European banks. And you know how they did it? They, how did they finance their purchases of these assets? The worst possible mortgage-backed securities and collateralized debt obligations, all the stuff that created the crisis. They borrowed from the United States. They borrowed from US money markets. So they brought a lot of capital out of the United States. And what did they do with it? They sent it right back and bought all these horrible assets. And so the story might be not about trade deficits and trade surplus, but an incredible explosion of assets flowing back and forth, gross flows of capital. Notice the trillions. I had billions up before. Maybe that's the problem. Maybe it's financial globalization gone completely amok. Maybe that's the crisis we should be worried about. Whoops. How do I get that back? So I get, I go want. where? Which slide do you want? There you go. Okay, great, thank you. So now, what does the United States do? The United States has an obligation to deal with a recession, right? It's got a big recession. Before, the cause of the recession was that interest rates were held too, too low for too long. Now there's a recession. The U.S. monetary authorities have to get out of that situation. So what do they do? They raise, they lower interest rates. They try to lower all interest rates. What does that do? That weakens the dollar, sends capital flowing out of the country. Where does that capital go? To the emerging market countries who want to be export-led, want to export more than they import, and they are having a hard time coping with that inflow of capital. And what are they saying as a result? Well, Guido Montega, the Brazilian finance minister, says, darn it, the United States is engaging in a currency war. The United States had earlier said, those countries that are perpetuating their exports over their imports, they're engaging in a currency war because they're forcing their currencies down in order to increase their exports. Now, the United States is being accused of the, of this, of the currency war by stimulating monetary policy, indirectly forcing the dollar down, sending capital abroad, creating pressure on those economies' currencies. Third, the Fed says, now we're going to tighten monetary policy. We're going to normalize it. Therefore, we're going to raise interest rates. Just the announcement two years ago that the United States was going to do that was enough to send capital massively out of Brazil massively out of all the emerging market countries and create a destabilizing effect for those economies. So where do we go from here? 
The U.S. is a monetary hegemon, no question about it. People talk about U.S. decline, right? There's always this debate about is the U.S. in decline, and in that sense, we're talking about military, economic, financial, political, cultural, the whole thing. But within the economic is the monetary, and there is absolutely no question that the U.S. is a hegemon in that realm. There's no way around it. But the debate is, can we get the United States not to enjoy itself so much, to have what is called an exorbitant privilege from having this structural position in the global economy? What do you do? Well, one option is to introduce a global uh, currency. Where are you going to get it? Go to the IMF. The IMF has something called the SDR, Special Drawing Rights. You've got a long way to go before the IMF can become a lender of last resort and the SDR can become a general currency. But Zhou Xiaochuan, governor of the Central Bank of China, says that's exactly what we need. We cannot have a currency for the world that is also the currency of one nation. There's a basic conflict there. The other way to go is to increase competition for the dollar, other national currencies. What are the logical currencies? The euro. Europe's got a whole bunch of problems right now. The eurozone is not functional. Can the euro really step up as a genuine competitor to the, to the U.S. dollar? Probably not right now. And the renminbi, the Chinese currency, is the major alternative to that. China has to do a whole lot of stuff domestically in order for its currency to be truly internationalized. So basically, there's a conflict over how to, how to deal with an international monetary system that nobody is fully happy with. But the bottom line is that the U.S. is still at the center and the dollar is still at the center of that system.